Welcome to another Bible in a Year Q&A uh, episode. This is for the readings from August 16th through the 31st. Uh, and going through some question on Job and a couple on 1 Corinthians. So the first one on Job is regarding chapter 14, verses 7 through 17. The question is, does this mean we may possibly be in limbo until Christ's second coming? Uh, no, that that's not what he's getting at. Um, Though it's though kind of verses 13 and 14 that maybe allude to that where he speaks of hide me in Sheol uh, and then your wrath let your wrath pass and then at your appointed time remember me uh, if a man die shall he live again all the days of my service I would wait till my release should come there's kind of this idea of uh, he's kind of he's suffering so much he's like Lord can I just die and then you bring me back when think kind of all this injustice is done. Um, but this idea of the afterlife, it's uh, in the wisdom literature, uh, you know, Job, and it gets developed further lo along in like the book of wisdom of this afterlife and kind of this God is just and uh, d d d just, just rewards, just, just deserts uh, of, of both the good and the wicked. Um, it gets kind of fleshed out more, but right now it's more of he's he's the focus is you know I just uh, I'd, I'd rather just kind of die and be in the rest of death. Uh, and Sheol here is the realm of the dead, uh, and at least early biblical kind of understanding. God slowly reveals more and more about the afterlife, uh, but it's in general the the earlier part of Scripture, the Old Testament focuses much more on the kind of the realm of the dead. It's kind of a shadowy realm uh, and kind of just a place of, of rest. But Job does hint at, like, well, the God has the capacity to, you know, have me die and then get all this injustice done, all this unfair unfair stuff, and then bring me back, you know. So it's more of the focus of he's um, kind of crying out, you know. Can I just, can I just, Lord, just have, let me die just, and then let me come back when, when it's peaceful. Uh, going on to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, 16 through 18, and it speaks of, oh great, I lost my page, the, uh, destroying the temple uh, of, if anyone destroys God's temple, you will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that temple you are. Um, and so it's, does this, the question is, does this speak against cremation? And so chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 16 through 18. Um, no, it's, uh, it doesn't. Actually, the, um, it wouldn't, it would be more of, he would speak of, you know, ki killing, murder and stuff would be kind of, that's more of what he's getting at, of using the analogy uh, of us. But actually, the, the passage here, this chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, we don't see it in the English because we use the same word for you, singular, or if you're speaking to many people, uh, you in the plural sometimes uh, you know, go south and y'all um, but really Paul if we want to translate it kind of so we hit that nuance is uh, for God's temple is holy in that temple y'all are so actually speaking of the, the community kind of together whoever destroys this whoever destroys this community this church in Corinth the, the community of believers uh, your God will destroy that person all right, so you're going to go after God's church and just, you know, cause factions because that's one of the big things taking place in here. Uh, so that's the primary thing um, of, uh, of what he's addressing here in chapter 3. It's chapter 6 when he uses, uh, and you are a temple of, are you not a temple of the Holy Spirit? He's using you, you in the singular. Um, but uh, some Bibles actually will kind of make a, a note, kind of, uh, many, many don't, though. They'll, they don't make a, dis uh, translations don't make the distinction for us. Uh, in English, so we're wondering, you know, but really it's the context there is he's referring to y'all are the temple of God, you as a, as a church, as a, you know, community of believers here in Corinth, whoever he attacks this, uh, destroys this, uh, God will destroy them. You're attacking God's kind of, uh, his people, his, his church, um, but create cremation. So this, um, so the background of cremation, the church didn't allow cremation for the longest, well, not for the longest, but for about, from the early 1700s until 1970 or so, uh, approximately, uh, they didn't allow cremation. And partly that was the, the movement of the Enlightenment. 
that were um, rationalists who they said God, you know, they, if they believe in God, he was, well, he's out there. He's like a watchmaker. He doesn't really have involvement in us. Maybe create everything, but then we're all on our own. And, um, but, but then also reject, they, they rejected kind of any, uh, any miraculous that God can intervene. And especially kind of the Christian, one of the things they would go after is the resurrection. Uh, you know, the, the, they thought it was ridiculous. There's no way God's not going to resurrect our bodies later on. And so what would they would do in spite of that, they would they would um, cremate in kind of defiance uh, in, in Europe, this Enlightenment movement. So the church came out and said, no, you can't, um, we're not going to not allow cremations, all right, uh, because it was associated with refused denial of the, the resurrection uh, of the dead. Now that's the practice is, is allowed now cremation. I think there's there's the beauty of the body, full body, especially at the funeral, because of uh, this is the person. Uh, but cremations are allowed in the church uh, so long as someone doesn't, uh, so long as um, they're they're going to be buried. Uh, and what's the other thing? Uh, the person isn't doing it out of spite of the resurrection all right <laughs> so if someone's like i'm gonna die i'm gonna get cremated and i'm doing it because i don't believe in the resurrection well i can't do the funeral then sorry you you've denied <laughs> everything that the funeral is giving kind of we're praying and and hoping for the for you after death um so cremation is allowed but there's a caveat all right so it's but it's, it was not allowed for many times because it was associated uh it was kind of used as a a group, the, the movement, intellectual movement, the enlightenment of denying uh, the the resurrection. It's kind of a tangent, but I wanted to ask the question about reformation there. Uh, and then the last question is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. I just got it here. So it speaks of marriage, or concerning marriage, this whole chapter he's concerning marriage. And he's speaking about the a believer married to an unbeliever, all right. And so uh, he's wondering, like, well, what if someone becomes? Paul's addressing the thing. Well, what if the wife becomes Christian and the husband isn't? What do you do? In it? You know, kind of these questions, or vice versa. If the husband becomes Christian and the wife isn't, uh, and so Paul is uh, kind of pointing to the that the the baptized uh, spouse that God want, can work through that person. You know, their intercession, uh, their love can can bring the other person kind of uh, to the Lord. Now, obviously, that person has freedom. And Paul isn't saying, we'll start preaching to your spouse, you know, kind of every day, every moment of the day that they need to become, they want to be saved. Uh, you need to go to Jesus Christ, be baptized. Uh, Paul doesn't say that. Uh, but he's saying that God wants to work uh, this this holy union of marriage, uh, God doesn't say we get baptized and you got to leave your spouse, all right? Because they're not. No, He says God wants to sanctify this this marriage uh, and and use the the baptized the Christian as as a conduit of grace for their spouse. Um, now it speaks of later on, um, but if the unbelieving partner desires to separate, let it be so. In such a case, the brother and sister, the sister is not bound, for God called you to peace. Uh, so he speaks of well, if you get baptized and your spouse leaves you because you get baptized, they're in a pagan, you know, culture and stuff. And what if there's a, <laughs> what you you got baptized? I'm leaving. You know, the spouse leaves. Uh, Paul says, all right, you're, all right, you, you need to put the Lord first. Um, and there's actually later on the development of the. The Pauline prince, uh, privilege, which, in that case, if if this um, a Christian is married to a non-Christian, uh, and that the non-Christian leaves, it's really it's, it can't be the Christian's fault for the separation. It'd be the Christian, the non-Christian, uh, either their unfaithfulness or because they want they don't want any connection with this Christian, uh, and they they leave. Um, the church kind of uh, there's has the power of the keys. Uh, to dissolve that marriage for in lieu of a sacramental marriage. Uh, so it's, I'm not going to go into the whole details there, but there's, uh, there's, there's one of kind of two things, but uh, the church, uh, the sacrament of marriage is indissolvable. Uh, 
uh, it's when it's between two baptized persons, indissolvable. Uh, when it's between a Christian and an unbaptized, uh, that marriage can be dissolved, and there's it's very there, there's very particular cases, but it's, it's kind of like this in this of if Christian uh, non Christian spouse leaves them, uh, that uh, that person is not bound bound. The church has the freedom to say, okay. Uh, you can get remarried if so long as it's a sacramental marriage. Um, it's normally not spoken of. I, I, I almost hesitate to mention it because it's like, well, wait, I thought that marriage was indissolvable. Sacramental marriage is indissolvable. But the church has the power um, to dissolve a marriage, a non-sacramental marriage, so between two unbaptized or between a baptized and non-baptized, because it's only a sacrament uh, if it's between two baptized. And so uh, that's that, it's a sacrament of marriage. But I can, but we are wondering, well, what if a baptized person gets married to a nun? Is it not a sacrament? Is it not a marriage? No, it's a marriage, right? And I've done marriages of between a Catholic and uh, a non-baptized person, unbaptized person, and uh, it's a marriage because marriage is it's built into our um, kind of our our humanity, the way God created us. Uh, we're made for for communion, and marriage kind of is built in. That's why I mentioned early on of Adam and Eve, uh, and, and having children. And um, chapter two, actually, of Genesis, really the the covenant piece of God's covenant with creation, but also then uh, the covenants of marriage God creates between man and woman, are kind of built in. Um, so the where am I now? Um, oh, I know now. Yes. So. Uh, the uh, a baptized Christian and unbaptized person mar is still a marriage, uh, but if the unbaptized person gets baptized, that that marriage automatically becomes a sacramental marriage. All right, and so uh, there's more graces. So God gives grace uh, in many ways, um, but the sacrament kind of gives bigger channels of grace. Why? Why would God? Why would God want to give more grace to sacramental marriage? Because He wants to show this is to lead them people to Him. That though that couple that that married couple uh, that have the sacrament of marriage, that their marriage is sacramental, that there'll be a light and draw other draw others to the Lord, uh, how the Lord is working in their marriage um, and in their lives. So I hope that helps. Uh, I don't want I don't want to get any more inter intricacies of, of 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 marriage and kind of the <laughs> uh, stuff with that. But please keep the questions coming. These are very good, and I love it when they, they kind of they bring up other topics too. So God bless.